Perfect. So thank you all for joining today, uh, our webinar. So this is before the FAFSA. So this is everything um, with the federal student aid ID process. Um, and we've also added some information as far as what we know so far for the process for parents without a social security number who can create a student um, an FSA ID as well. Um, so we are communicating to you the latest and greatest information that we have. We know there's more information coming down the pipeline, but definitely this will help prepare you and your students with kind of the first initial step um, to completing their FAFSA. So um, going on to the next slide here. Well, actually, I should introduce ourselves. So Diana, I'll have you introduce. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I think neither of us needs any introduction right now. Um, my name is Diana Matier, and I am very privileged to work with Julie um, in presenting the FAFSA boot camp series. I am employed by College Depot, a division of the Phoenix Public Library, where I am an advisor and financial aid specialist working remotely for the state of Arizona um, in conjunction with Julie and the Arizona Board of Regents today and uh, tuning in from sunny Las Vegas, Nevada. So yes, I am a gambler at heart. That is why I told you all to vote for the best day um, for the FAFSA coming out. And I'm really glad to see you're all lighthearted to begin with. You're all picking dates and you're all kind of joyous about it. So we will try to keep that joy going as we talk to you today. Julie? Awesome. Thanks, Dana. My name is Julie Sines. So I'm with the Arizona Board of Regents. I'm the director of Fast Fund College Access Programs. So I'm very happy that Diana is here today um, with us in helping host these uh, boot camp series for everyone. So this is kind of our first boot camp series, really kicking off the whole uh, webinar series. Um, so without further ado, we're just going to kind of dive into the information. This again, this recording, this will be recorded and we will share it out with everyone. We'll also share out any resources and also the PowerPoint slides. So as long as you've registered for the webinar, just know that this will be coming your way. So again, uh, FAFSA opens in December. We're still unsure as to what date when it's going to open. So I think a lot of you have some really great bets that you've put in the, the chat here, and it can be any one of those days. Um, but the big thing is that for your current high school seniors graduating in 2024 in May, um, they're going to complete this application that's going to come out in December. And the important thing is that them and their parents are going to be using the 2022 tax information on this FAFSA here. If you have any high school seniors who are graduating early in December, just note that they will um, complete the current FAFSA that is out right now, which is the 2023-2024 FAFSA, if they're looking to start college in January right after they graduate in December. So majority of your seniors are going to be grad traditional graduates graduating in May. So just know that this is the application in December that they're going to want to complete. But any graduates that you have completing their diploma early and going on to college in January will complete the 2023-2024 FAFSA. So a little confusing there. Um, current FAFSA is still open, which is the 2023-2024. There's a little overlap, so keep that in mind. That's sometimes students get confused and complete the wrong one. But the one that you're going to be focusing on for the majority of your seniors is going to be the FAFSA coming out in December, which is the 2024-2025 FAFSA. So hopefully that didn't confuse everyone there, um, but just know the FAFSA coming out in December is really kind of the main focus for the majority of your seniors, unless they are graduating early. So what is an FSA ID? So the FSA ID is a username and password um, used to log into certain U.S. Department of Education sites, including studentaid.gov. So it basically acts as a login so that the student can access their FAFSA, so the student can access their, um, their record of any student loans or federal aid that they have taken out. It really carries with the student through their lifetime. So that way they can log in and see all of their information. So it's really the, the first step for a student to complete their FAFSA and the first step for them to continue on their federal student aid journey. So it carries with that student. Um, the FSA ID is a student or parent's legal electronic signature as well. So it provides an electronic signature um, so that they're not having to print and sign things. Um, so it is kind of a, a legal um, type of thing that a, a student and parent are creating um, to verify the information on their FAFSA is correct. 
And then also the FSA ID will be used every year to fill out the FAFSA. So once a student creates their FSA ID and they have to renew their FAFSA every year that they're in college, they're gonna use that same FSA ID every year to renew it, to log in and get access to their information. Same thing for the parent. Once they create it, it continues on with the parent. So creating an FSA ID. So all students must have a social security number to create an FSA ID. So keep that in mind. In order to be eligible for federal student aid, students have to have a social security number. But now there's a little bit different process for parents. So parents with a social security number will do the same process as a student to create their federal student ID. It's a lifetime usage. So once that parent creates their FSA ID to help their child complete the FAFSA application, they don't have to recreate it every year. Um, if a parent had their FSA ID when they went to college, they will use that same FSA ID. They don't have to create a new one to, um, to help their child through the FAFSA process. The new one is that parents without a social security number are now able to create an FSA ID. So in the past, they have not been able to create one. And then what they would have to do is put all zeros on the FAFSA application, print out the signature page, sign it and mail it in. Um, we all know that sometimes with that, it would take a long time, six to eight weeks for that to be processed, um, for them to actually get that mail. So now in order um, to simplify things and as part of the FAFSA simplification process, parents without a social are now able to create an FSA ID. It is a different process a little bit. Um, so the process is not exactly the same for a parent um, or a student with a social security number creating one. And keep in mind that a parent without a social security number must create an F a new FSA ID for themselves every year because they have to validate it every year. So it's not something that's a lifetime usage. It's something that every time that their student actually has to renew their FAFSA, they're going to have to go through that creation process every year. Um, unlike a parent with a social or a student with a social, it's carried through the lifetime. So right now, students with a social security number and parents with a social security number can create an FSA ID. So they can go to studentaid.gov, they can create it, it's all available, and Diana's going to go through the steps on how to do that. Currently, we're still waiting on guidance from federal student aid as to when parents without a social security number are going to be able to create their FSA ID. Um, we've heard in December when the FAFSA launches is most likely when that process will roll out, but today we'll give you a preview of what that process will look like, um, knowing that some there may be some changes between now and then. Um, Diana, I'm not quite sure if you want to add anything here. No, I think that's perfect, Julie. Um, so this is just a quick overview. So FSA ID stands for Federal Student Aid ID. It is a username and password. So it's a username that the student creates and it's also a password that they create, again, to log into their FAFSA and to log into all their federal student aid information. Um, student and parent must create their own FSA ID. So everyone must create their own. A parent can't use a student's and a student can't use a parent's. It's not interchangeable. Um, you must have a social security number to create one currently. Parents, again, without a social security number will be able to create one later this fall, most likely in December. Um, FSA IDs will be used every year. Um, so keep in mind, it's to electronically, again, sign the federal, um, the FAFSA form. It's to complete any student loan paperwork, and it's also to log into the U.S. Department of Education websites. So it's really a, an important um, ID that students will use that will carry on with them to access all of their personal information. So it's not something that should be shared. Um, and also the um, FSA ID password must be reset periodically. So sometimes a student will get a notification email saying you must update your password just to keep security um, up to date. Um, so many of you may get that with you know, different things that you log in to update your password. This is the same here, just to make sure that um, you know, security is there and it, it's a strong password for the student. Keep in mind, I know we already talked about this, but if a parent has previously created an FSA ID for themselves while they were attending school or for another one of their children who completed the FAFSA in a prior year, they do not need to create a new FSA ID. So if that parent went to college themselves um, and they created an FSA ID because they completed the FAFSA 
they do not need to create a new one. They will use that same FSA ID. Or if they had to create an FSA ID for an older sibling, um, they would just use that same FSA ID. The only person that would need to create a new one is that that student completing the, the, the FAFSA form, their high school senior this year. So um, things to keep in mind, um, when you are creating a FSA ID, you want to choose an email account you can easily access. So we always recommend that students use a Yahoo or Gmail account and they do not use their high school um, school account because once they graduate high school, they won't have access to that account anymore. So if they need to reset their password, anything of that sort, they won't get those communications. So it's best to have an email that's Yahoo, Gmail, you know, whatever else that's a free email account that they can utilize. So that way they can access it beyond high school. And that way it's not connected to a school in case they are not enrolled anymore. Or once they graduate, they won't have access to it. Um, if a username is already taken, they just choose another one. Students can choose any username, combination of words, their first name, last name, whatever it may be. Um, when Diana goes through the process, it will show you if that username is already taken, and then you just simply change it up a little bit to see if that one's taken, or you just create a new one. Um, so it will definitely tell you. We do recommend that students don't use their name or date of birth in their password. Um, they use a secure password, you know, something that's um, unique, something that has maybe some numbers, some special characters in it. That way it just creates a stronger password. And then also we do recommend that there is a section when they are creating the FSA ID that says show text. That way a student can see exactly what they're typing in. Um, because I, I don't know about you guys, but I know me sometimes when I'm typing in my password to get in my computer, I'm typing so fast and I don't realize that I'm typing the wrong keys. So sometimes that happens with students and then they go on with the process and they're like, well, this is the password that I put in. And they didn't actually show text because it could be a, a letter off or a number off or something that they didn't intend to input. So always make sure that they put um, show text on there so that way they can go ahead and, and see what they're inputting for this information. Um, who needs to create an FSA ID? So all students who are filling out the FAFSA need to create an FSA ID. Again, they can do that now. So even though the FAFSA is coming out in December, this process is something students can do now, and it's really proactive for them to do now as well. So that way it's just one less step for them to complete. So when the FAFSA does come out, they're all ready to go. Um, for married students, it would be also the student's spouse, um, only if the student and their spouse did not file taxes together. So if you have any students that are married and they didn't file taxes together, then the student and their spouse would need to create an FSA ID. If they filed taxes together, then it would just need to be the student. Um, for dependent students, which would be the majority of your high school seniors, um, for parents or step parents who are required to be listed on the FAFSA, if they file taxes together, so if the parents file taxes together, only one parent will need to create an FSA ID because what will happen is since they filed together, if either mom or parent one or parent two um, created an FSA ID, that tax information will be carried over onto the FAFSA form for both parents. Um, if they did not file taxes together, meaning that they each filed separately, then both parents will need to create an FSA ID. So it really just depends on how parents file taxes. If they file jointly, then only one parent does. If they file separately, then both parents will have to. Um, so just keep that in mind there. Um, and we'll go over some more information. Um, but just the most important thing right now is that all students need to create their FSA ID. Um, that's, that's something that all of them must do there. So I'm going to hand it over to Diana to talk about creating an FSA ID. So she'll talk about the steps to create it and then also the steps for parents who file a social security number. Thank you. And Julie, I see some Q&A here. I started to answer them, but um, I'm up now. So if we don't get to your question, um, please let us know at the end. We should have some time for questions. And Julie, you may be more successful than me in answering in the chat or the Q&A. <laughs> but uh, my part today is to talk to you about the actual steps in creating an FSA ID at studentaid.gov. Um, and it's pretty seamless. If you've ever created one before um, with a student, nothing really has changed about this process. It's been updated a little bit. It looks a little different than it did in past years. 
but it is still one of the most confusing parts of completion of the FAFSA for our students. And we want you to realize that you can process um, and again, it is the same process as it's always been. It is the same process if you're an incoming freshman or you're a transfer student who has never had financial aid before. Um, so I think it's important that you know that what you're seeing here today really is not vastly different from what you've seen in the past. When you begin to create an account in studentaid.gov, you are going to see two options, either get started on creating one, or if you already have an account, to log in. And that's the point at which you would be doing your FAFSA or viewing your student loans or any other thing. As Julie mentioned to you, there are a number of uses of the FSA ID. The primary one is FAFSA completion, but it is also the ID to check loan status, apply for loans, uh, if, look at other things on your dashboard, like how much grant usage you have, and so it's a very neat tool to have this ID so you can log in seamlessly. I've been helping a lot of students who are out of college now and they're facing student loan repayment to actually use their FSA ID to go to studentaid.gov to check that. What you will need to create your account, at a minimum, your social security number, that's true right now. And we do suggest that we'll talk about registering your email or your mobile phone in a few minutes, we suggest you do both. So at a minimum, you need to have a valid email address that you can access easily. And secondly, if you wish to uh, register your mobile phone, that is a good idea as well, because all of these things can help you in the recovery process. Next, Julie. All right, as in anything, when you're registering or creating an account, you are putting in personal information. It is extremely critical for students that they be able to access their legal name as it appears on their social security card because the important part of this process is there is a match with the social security administration. They wanna be sure that your number and your name match identically with what they have in their system. So first name, middle initial, last name, date of birth. You'd be surprised at how many typos I see in this. Again, it is a match feature. So it's important that they say I was born in 2006 and not 2005, if that is the case. And again, people get very keyed up and nervous when they're doing this process. So you just need to tell them to calm down, breathe, and make sure the information is correct. And of course, their social security number. I also see a lot of typos here. You need to double check, triple check it, make sure you don't have any typos in it because if you don't get a match with the social security administration, you cannot proceed with your FSA ID or your FAFSA. Next, Julie. There are several screens in this create an account process. They're all pretty easy and pretty self-explanatory but you would be amazed, or maybe not, I'm not, at how much people can get confused in this process. So you will note that if the student doesn't have a social security number and they answer, I don't have one, they really should go no further because they really should not be doing the federal student aid process. They're not gonna qualify for anything. So this is really for parents where it says, I do not have a social security number, when parents are allowed to go into the process, it will probably look something like this. But again, you should not be working with any student to create an FSA ID who has no social. It is not possible to do that if you are a student. Next, please. All right, now we're gonna talk about the big elephant in the room, and that is, as Julie mentioned, the parents without SSNs. Um, this process, we have no idea what it's going to look like, but we've sure heard a lot about what it should look like. And what we know right now is everyone who's going to help the student fill out the FAFSA, i.e. the parents, now called contributors to the FAFSA form, will be required to create an FSA ID. They cannot complete anything but a paper form if they don't have an FSA ID for entry. And we do discourage you from having your students complete paper forms. It's a nightmare. Also, the paper form, if you've looked at it in draft format, is 25 pages long 
largely instructions, but it is a very scary document. Stay away from it if you can. But for those who can create an FSA ID in December, those parents without an SSN, uh, identity verification is going to be used. Um, for students who are from the freely associated states, we don't see too many of those, or parents without an SSN. They are going to have the option to complete knowledge-based identity questions. And what that is, is a process, you've probably all seen it, when you apply for something, maybe a credit card, um, where you apply for certain types of benefits, like I think we saw this when my husband and I applied for social security benefits, it will ask you questions about things you should know. Like was your first car blue or green? Um, or was it a Ford or an Acura more appropriately? Because there might be something in a credit bureau system and this is credit bureau based using TransUnion's knowledge based system where they will know if you ever registered a car, bought a car, took out a loan, lived at a different address, and you have to answer those questions successfully in order to pass knowledge-based identity. I know many of us who are perfectly American citizens that have social security numbers and we think we're okay, we can't answer those knowledge-based questions always, but your, your parents without SSNs will be expected to bump up against this process and answer the questions if they can. If it's successful, the FSA ID is authenticated and available to use immediately. However, what if it is unsuccessful? There's going to be a third option for those people or a second option really for those folks who are in this situation to create a manual documentation process. We don't know anything about it right now, but it's going to be available for those who cannot pass the knowledge-based identity questions because they have no information out there with credit bureaus. They have nothing to indicate what their former address or the model of their car was. They will be given a third option. One of these options should meet their requirements. We don't know what's going to happen if it doesn't. I guess the paper form is still a last resort, but keep in mind they're going to have multiple ways to authenticate their identity. We don't know exactly what the process will look like, the types of questions that are going to be asked, although we can predict it's things like where did you used to live, um, what was your first car loan, um, and if you can remember those things, good for you. And the documents that FSA will request to confirm identity, we really do not know what that is. That's probably a uh, part of the process of manual documentation, but we do not know at this point what that will look like. Uh, and again, the students from freely associated states will also need to go through this process to create their FSA IDs. Um, if you ever have one of those, my best advice is to call Julie or me and we'll work through it together. Next, please. This is the ID match and verification flow. It's a pretty complicated but colorful chart that will show you basically if the user has an SSN, either the parent or the student, they will bump up against the Social, Administ Social Security Administration and there will be updates uh, for them as they go through the process. And if they have to contact the Social Security Administration to resolve, they can do that here too. But that's pretty much a seamless process. Most of the time, everybody matches. However, what if you don't have an SSN and you're the parent? If you don't, you will go through the knowledge-based verification. And if that works, your user identity will be verified and you can use your FSA ID immediately. It doesn't have to bump up against the Social Security Administration because there is nothing out there in the SSA on that person. And if that doesn't work, you will notice that there's a third box down at the bottom here called ID proofing. Again, we don't really know what that means, but we know what to call it. And that will also lead to possibly having the user identity verified. We surely do hope so. 
because we're hoping everyone can enter the FAFSA electronically through the FSA ID process. Next, please. All right, this is what happens when you create an account. You have to choose some identifiers for yourself that supposedly only you will know and you do not share with the universe. Number one is a username. Uh, the username is probably, in my estimation, the least important part of the process because you can always access your FSA ID information once you create it, if you remember the email you used or the telephone number or both that you put in. But it's helpful to create a username, something easy. For instance, I tried to create a username of Dematier, and surprisingly enough, that name was taken and it said it's not available. I simply used Dematier1 and that was available. Um, I've since changed it, by the way, guys, so you can't get in as me. Um, but you do have the option, again, of, of if the username is taken, creating a second one. Your email address is critical because much of the communication that you get is to an email. And students who have frequently changed their email addresses or use their school email address should use a reliable one that is going to be constant because at some point it is likely that they're going to need to access that email so they don't want to shut it down. Uh, there's a confirmation of the email address, obviously, for those of us who are prone to typos. And then we have to create a password. Julie mentioned to you the creation of the password should not include birthday, name. Um, they give you some parameters here. And this, if the student follows it and puts in their password correctly and confirms it, they should show the text so they're sure that they're using uh, pretty dog one and not pretty dog two, for instance. That's an example of a password that frequently is used by parents or students. They use a pet's name or they reference the kind of pet that they have. Um, so that's the first screen and the most important. Once they create it, write it down or take a picture of it or put it in the notes on your phone. It is critical that you not spend an inordinate amount of time with students and they don't waste their time trying to figure out what their FSA ID is. There are recovery options, but sometimes I have spent as much as 45 minutes with a student trying to figure out what they use to create this login. Next, please. All right, now permanent address, mobile phone, account access, and if you wish to register your, your mobile phone, and I really encourage it because sometimes people have a much harder time getting into their emails, even on their phone, than they do getting a text message. So we really encourage you to register, have your students register their mobile phones here um, or whatever they may need to get into their accounts. Next, please. So, so far so obvious, right? You're creating everything. Now you're looking at your communications. How do you wanna hear from the Department of Education? The very worst choice is by snail mail. The very best choice is by email because sometimes their text messages are going to be very lengthy and they can't be sent conveniently that way. But they will most definitely keep in constant communication with you as a student through an email address. So I strongly encourage that. You do get a language preference here. So even students can choose a different language than English if they're more comfortable looking at their emails in another language that is their first language of choice. Next, please. All right, now we get to the part I always have loved the best since the FSA ID has been in process for many years now. These are challenge questions. I always tell students, this is the absolute last way you should try to figure out how to get into your FSA ID, but it is a way. The reason I say it's a last resort is that if you just need the Department of Ed to send you a code, um, either by text or email, it's pretty easy to get into your, your FAFSA that way and to correct any errors in your FSA ID. If you have to use your challenge questions, even if you remember all of them and all of the answers to them, you have to wait a period of time, usually several minutes, 
before you can even access anything. So challenge questions are your last resort. You can have students write them down. You'll notice they are uh, pre-filled questions now. Uh, you don't have to make up your own. You just have to use four different ones. And we even encourage students to write down by their ID and their password to write these questions down in case they need them at any point. You also get a backup code now once you create your FSA ID. If everything fails and you can find that backup code, good luck with that, right? You can use that as a one-time way of entry as well. Challenge questions though are as basic as what color was your first car and what's your mother's maiden name and who's your best friend from childhood, that kind of thing. Um, these are pretty easy to answer, but students spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out which ones they want to pick. <laughs> Next. All right. Now, this is the information that you have entered. It gives you one last chance to go back and change it or not. So they need to check very carefully their legal name, their birth date, their social security number, their contact information. This is the last opportunity to review, confirm, and agree to the terms. The terms are basically that this is a government site you're entering when you use your FSA ID. You need to be the one that enters. Um, it's all the legal language you're used to when um, any entity is asking you for ID verification before they let you access your bank statement, your credit card, whatever that might be. This is just like that. Okay, next. All right, and now account recovery. If you mess up, if you don't remember your ID or your password, how do you wanna get your code, your one-time code? I know PayPal asks me for this every time I buy something and use PayPal. This is the same. Every time you log into a government system, not just the first time, but every time, they will send you a code to authenticate that you are you. Do you want that code by email, by mobile phone, or by either one? My suggestion is to have both verified because then you can use either one. And most of the time when students are out, it's easier for them to use if they're in your office or in the College Depot or at a high school night that they are using their mobile phone because it's easier to get the code that way but I strongly encourage verification of both. Next. All right, once submitted online, everything looks good. You hit submit, I wanna create the FSA ID. It will take approximately three to five days for the authentication to be verified through the Social Security Administration. Notice that on that, that parent without an SSN, they will get verification immediately but right now the FSA ID takes approximately three to five days to be verified. I created one for my own husband a few days ago and it took about three days for the authentication to take place. They should send you an email that says you have matched with the social security administration. In his case, he never got an email, but I was able to go in and look at with using my FSA ID see that had matched with the Social Security Administration. That simply means now I'm ready to go. My FSA ID is verified, and that is going to be a critical component in beginning the FAFSA. If it's not verified, there's not too much you can do in the FAFSA. Um, we'll talk about that next week in our FAFSA 101 session. But remember, if you can do the FSA ID right now, it's certainly going to be verified before December. Um, it should be created in order to successfully complete the FAFSA with no hiccups. So that's why we're re really emphasizing do it early this year. And you'll notice we're saying do it now, do it now, but remember it for December. <laughs> okay, next please. The federal process of the FSA ID of FAFSA is, does require the student agree to some additional matches. This is an agreement by the student that they will bump up against certain things. So you can tell parents who don't have an SSN, uh, they are not going to bump up against Homeland Security. So there is not a risk because of 
privacy laws are very strict in this. Homeland Security is not going to identify them as undocumented parents. But for the student, there are a number of matches that they agree to when they agree to the terms and conditions. The first one is the most obvious, the SSA. Uh, Department of Defense uh, and the Veterans Administration to determine if the student automatically meets veteran status or if they need to provide additional documentation. There is a bump against the National Student Loan Data System, which tells FAFSA and the processor if the student is in default on an, any other student loan, which likely a high school student will not be. And they will match with Homeland Security if they are not citizens and they don't match with the SSA necessarily. They will have an A number if they are a permanent resident and that A number will match against Homeland Security because they do have a record that they are a permanent resident or their asylum seekers, um, grantees, et cetera. So it's important for students to know this isn't going out to the whole universe. Obviously this information is going out to other government agencies that need to know or need to identify the student for benefits. And obviously the information will also go to the schools that the student has put on their FAFSA. Next, please. Some ID tips for you. Um, we can't say this enough. Right now, start creating the FSA IDs. Parents and students are anxious to do something. Get them started on the process. This is something they could do proactively to get ready for December. Um, English class, government class, special night. There are all kinds of ways to create an FSA ID and it's not that difficult. It's a little time consuming, but it can be done in a classroom environment or in a brief meeting after school. Remind students, save the information because it's gonna save them a lot of headaches afterwards or a call to the FSA hotline, which is not a fun experience because you might be on hold for a little bit of time if you've gotta have somebody help you do the reset. And have the students help their parents create an FSA ID if they can. Again, if this parent has a social security number, have them create with the student an FSA ID for themselves. Um, and you only need one FSA ID for parents. If you've ever helped students in the past, that's all you ever needed, right? One parent needed to agree, even if it was a two parent family. Now, sometimes two parents will need to create FSA IDs. And that is in the case where you have a married couple who filed separately in 2022, the IRS is going to have to locate two tax returns. So two FSA IDs will be necessary in order to give consent for the IRS to release information on both parties. Also, if the parent is remarried and they filed taxes separately from their current spouse in 2022, they must also have two FSA IDs, one for the natural or adoptive parent and one for the step parent. But what about parents who created one FSA ID, but they filed taxes together in 2022? In those cases, only one person needs to have an FSA ID and grant consent for a joint tax return. And this is one very important point. So if you have questions, ask them now and we'll address them at the end. But there are instances in which two people in addition to the student, we'll need an FSA ID. Next, please. Uh, the IRS direct data exchange will be discussed in more detail next week, but it is a direct exchange, unlike the IRS data retrieval. The parent and student have to do nothing except grant consent. And they can only do that if they have an FSA ID. That is the authenticator for the IRS and it is very strict about that. So that is why, because right off the bat, you have to grant consent for any tax information on file to be transferred. You have to have an FSA ID in order to do that. And consent has to be granted to reach the IRS or the FAFSA will not be processed and the student will not be eligible for federal aid. So it is not possible 
to say, I don't want the IRS to transfer my information if there is any. Um, I don't want to play nice with this process. They have to, because if they do not, nothing is going to happen to this FAFSA. And there will be an additional discussion of this next week. So we're enticing you a little bit to log in next week too with us. Next. Uh, Julie, I think you were going to talk about this because this is your creation. Our creation. So yeah. So Diana and I put together this FAFSA resource. So it has a step-by-step -step guide to really creating the FSA ID. So it really starts mm -hmm. from going to the, the studentaid.gov site, the exact address, um, everything that Diana went through, entering the information, username, password, verifying it. Um, so it also has some helpful tips. So in all the materials that we're going to send out to you, in addition to the recording in this presentation, we'll also share out this handout. So that way, if you're having any FSA ID workshops, or you just want to hand it out to your students, um, that way they have it available to them as a helpful guide, feel free to do so. Um, but we definitely just wanted to create this and some simple steps as to create it. And it really goes step by step. You'll notice at the bottom, it says, please note, if parents do not have a social security number, they can't create an FSA at this time. They'll be able to do so in later fall. So once we have some more guidance and confirm guidance on exactly what that process looks like and we'll have screenshots to share with you, we'll create a, an additional form on the backside of this one. That way it has a guide um, for those parents as well. And it's just a one pager front and back. Um, so just know we wanted to share out this one with you right now, since we are really encouraging all high school seniors right now to complete their, to create their FSA ID. Um, in addition, we also wanted to share some additional statewide resources. So if a student does have some questions on, you know, just FAFSA in general, creating their FSA ID, there's always Ask Benji. There's the FAFSA hotline, which students can call Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then we also have virtual student appointments. So if a student wants to schedule an appointment to go step by step or if a parent wants to schedule an appointment to go step by step to create the FSA ID, just know that this is available. The appointments are available on Monday through Saturday. Um, so parents can easily text, call or create um, a virtual appointment. And then we also wanted to include the Federal Student Aid um, Information Center number as well. Um, and then also they do have chat available too. I think I saw in our um, chat here that somebody had used it and it was successful. So um, just know that there's plenty of options available in case the student just wants an extra guidance completing their FSA ID um, or just has any questions in general about FAFSA. Um, so now we're going to kind of pivot and go to some questions. Um, we did answer some throughout the webinar. However, I did save some just for this. So I'm going to kind of go back a little bit. Um, one of the questions were, how are they going to verify parents that do not have a social security number by previous purchases? How do you get a loan to purchase something if you don't have a social security number? This seems a little silly, like the federal government doesn't understand this population of parents. So uh, can yeah. I just answer that with a one word? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, you're absolutely right. This is difficult. Um, however, I think they think, um, we don't know at this point really what the TransUnion knowledge-based system looks like. TransUnion is a credit bureau, but it is also an identity verification service. So somehow or another, some of these parents, they think will be able to answer these questions. I don't know how you get a car loan without a social security number. I, I never tried, um, but they say they think this is going to work. That's all I can tell you. If it doesn't, and they obviously have gotten a lot of comments that it's not gonna work for undocumented parents. There is this other option for identity proofing, I think they call it, Julie. Yeah, ID proofing. Mm -hmm. And whatever that's going to look like, nobody knows. I don't think we've seen it yet. Gina, I hope that answers your question. That was a concern that Diana and I had, as well as other states have as well. Um, so we'll just have to wait till the process rolls out. And I think a lot of um, parents without a social security number may have to default to that ID proofing. And then once we know more information on that, we'll definitely share it out. Um, 
So another question was, um, I think I heard two different things. If a parent doesn't have a social security number and they are using the knowledge-based identity questions, are they at risk for being revealed to be undocumented? As far as we know, no, because it's not matched through Homeland Security, um, but I'll let Diana chime in on that. In case um, there's anything else. Yeah, I, I agree completely, Julie. Um, it is hard to tell an undocumented parent Put all your information out there. Nobody's going to get you, right? Um, I've never seen it happen. Let's put it that way. And I've been doing this for many, many years, including with the College Depot since 2015 and even earlier than that. Um, privacy laws are very strict when it comes to the parent. They're not going to share their information with Homeland Security. And that's why an undocumented student shouldn't be doing the FAFSA either. Um, but we hear they're not going to, I've never seen it happen. Okay. I always say to my parents, um, you know, I, I can't say never will it ever happen because there are weird things happening in this world, but the privacy laws are very strict in the U S and I don't think we'll ever see anyone deported or under ice or Homeland security because they were undocumented. Um, on the FAFSA. But I always tell parents, I can't guarantee you anything in this world. But I always tell them, your student is eligible for as much as $7,000 in grant aid and a whole bunch more. You know, they might be going to, to Washington University in St. Louis and get $85,000 in free money, basically free tuition and room and board. But they're not going to get that if they don't do a FAFSA. So I always tell them, weigh those two things. And they'll always come back to me and say, I want my child to have this education. I'm going to do it. And I'm not afraid of the risk because it's very low. That's how I approach it. I have found that these the, the families in this situation are more concerned with the status of their child even than they are themselves. And that's a, a beautiful thing. But it's also, you know, everything has a risk, right? Not not the best answer in the world, but the only one we can give. Thanks, Diana. So another question that came through, we've had quite a lot of these just kind of in a different version, but basically, do both parents need to create an FSA ID? So both parents only need to create an FSA ID if they filed separately. If they filed jointly, then only one parent needs to create the FSA ID. Um, so I hope that answers a lot of questions there um, that folks had. Um, and then there's another question here. It says if both parents are deceased and the student is in the custody of a new guardian, who will apply for a federal student aid ID aside from the student? Um, if they have a legal guardian, uh, both parent or both parents are deceased, uh, then they are independent. They don't have anybody else on the FAFSA unless they're married they have a spouse, which usually 17 year olds aren't quite married yet, or 18 year olds. Um, so if their parents are deceased, that is one of the dependency questions. I want you to remember that the dependency criteria have not changed, even though everything else on the FAFSA is changing. So if they were an orphan or ward of the court, both parents were deceased, they have a legal guardian, um, the only people who are parents are natural, adoptive, or step parents. Not brother, sister, aunt, or uncle that they live with casually, not their dogs, cats, et cetera. Yes. Um, I think we're, we're good there, Diana, so we can go on. But if there's any additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat or put them in the Q&A section, and then we can definitely address them. Um, but just kind of carrying on, um, we did want to just announce that we do, if you haven't already, have uh, the FAFSA kickoff, which is also an ASCAN, the Arizona College Access Network launch on December 1st. So in addition to these webinar series that we do have going on, um, we will have this event, which has national guest speakers, 
Um, it'll be on December 1st at the ASU West campus. It's completely free. It'll include breakfast and lunch and parking's free as well, um, which is a big plus. Um, so we have the QR code. We'll also send out the registration link. Diana is coming down from Las Vegas, so she'll be here in person. So if any of you want to meet her, she'll have uh, two sessions available. Um, so definitely, if you can make it, we hope that you'll be there. Um, right now, it's just an in-person event. We're trying to work with ASU to see if there's a possibility to do a virtual option. So if that's the case, then we'll definitely communicate that out. Um, however, if you are able to register, please um, let us know. Um, and we'll go ahead and I'll send the registration link out to everyone, um, but you can also scan the QR code on here and it will take you there as well. So just kind of wanted to put a little plug there for that. Um, and then as we go on, I uh, just also wanted to share uh, contact information. So Diana, as always, uh, generously has uh, provided her cell phone number um, and email address. So if you have any questions, um, you can contact Diana or you can contact myself. Best way to contact me is email. Um, Diana, email and cell number. She's provided both of them there. So if you have any questions or if you're working with a student and not quite sure of something, it's definitely a number that you may want to keep in, and save in your phone as a handy resource. Yes. Um, I the very worst number there is the 261 number. I'm not at the depot, obviously, but they do uh, let me know if I get a call there. I do absolutely, however, answer my, every cell phone text or voice message, usually within 24 hours or 24 minutes, uh, depending. Uh, since we had about eight minutes, I think, Julie, mm -hmm. um, I am getting a ton of questions on one subject and could I cover it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you're all going to be interested, I think, uh, cause you're all asking this question. What about my parents who have not filed a tax return? Um, because typically because they're undocumented and they don't have a social security number in I-10. So they either have chosen not to, felt they didn't have to, did, were not able to, didn't understand how to fill out um, a, a tax return, so they simply didn't file. What do you do with those people? Um, I bet you're all throwing up your hands going, yeah, I have that. What do I do? Your job and my job is to help the student fill out the FAFSA and the parents to fill out the FAFSA as best they can. There is a question on the uh, obviously, that's the Social Security, and this, or I'm sorry, if IRS can't find their tax return, that's all they say. You did not file. Not you did not have to file. You did not file. But what if you know they should have? They made $50,000 in a cash business in landscaping or construction um, or anything, and they've not filed taxes at least not under that social security number, <clears throat> excuse me, those folks will say, I did not file a tax return and the IRS will not find one. There are two options on the FAFSA. One of them is I did not file because I did not earn enough money. And it's not up to you to know the answer to that. It's up to them to know the answer to that. Or I did not file for other reasons. And we don't really know what that means. Other reasons could be, I hate the government. I didn't know I had to, um, on and on. There are a number of reasons, but we don't know what will happen if you say that. The best advice you can give to those families is you should fill out the FAFSA. You should say, I did not file a tax return. You need to check one of those boxes as to why you did not. And you will not be asked a single other question. You won't be asked about untaxed income. You won't be asked about anything else. You, Your student will be assigned uh, what is in effect a maximum financial aid student aid index, meaning they will either be zero or a negative number. But I cannot guarantee, and neither can you, that a college or university won't start asking more questions particularly if the parent says, I did not file for other reasons. So you need to not be so enthusiastic that you say to the student, oh, you're going to have a zero and you're going to get maximum Pell and you're going to get financial aid like through the roof. And then they find out later that the college or university is bound by law to ask more questions. 
So keep in mind, your job is to get that FAFSA completed, but also to let the parent and student know you didn't file a tax return and you made $50,000. You might have to explain that at some point, but you do not have to explain it when you fill out the FAFSA. So don't let that stop you, but also don't guarantee that this money is for sure because money is not for sure until fall semester begins. That probably inspired a lot more questions, many of which will be answered next week, but I just had to get it out there because you all call wringing your hands going, what do I do? I don't know what you do at this point, but my best advice is try to finish it. Thanks, Diana. So I did put in the, um, I did keep up Diana's and my contact information. So hopefully everybody captured that. Again, we'll send out the presentation that includes all of the slides that we covered today, as well as the re recording for this webinar and also that um, FSA ID handout. So we'll definitely share that. So you can share it among your students and parents. Um, also in the chat, I put the link to the December 1st event where Diana will be present to, um, you can meet her in person and answer all these questions that you guys have. Um, and hopefully by then we'll also know exactly when the FAFSA is coming out. But definitely if you can make it, um, we definitely would love to see everyone and be able to see everyone in person. Um, so that registration link is there. And then next Thursday, we have our next series in the boot camp um, training, which is FAFSA 101. So we're going to have an overview of the FAFSA form and really go in depth on Pell eligibility with those new Pell charts. Um, and the SAI index. So hopefully everyone can register and join. Um, but other than that, I, I think we, oh, looks like we have some questions in the Q&A, Diana, if you have a- I do. Let's see. Um, is it- has, is questions. It, <laughs> I do. It says, um, is it similar for a student has a parent who, is, for example, estranged and absolutely refuses to complete their portion of the FAFSA. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, the student does have the option on the new FAFSA of doing what they've always been able to say, which is, I cannot reach my parents. Not that they refuse to help me, but that I can't locate them. I don't talk to them. They hate me. They're in jail. You name it, right? If they cannot, they can complete the FAFSA by answering the question, I'm not going to answer questions on my parents, and they will be granted what is called provisional independence, which means the FAFSA will process. That's a change this year. Before it didn't. But that's not the end of the line. If they have, un that's called unusual circumstances, and that will require the student to communicate with the college or university and do what they've always had to do which is to prove through some kind of documentation that they don't talk to their parents and they don't even know where they are maybe. And that could be documentation from a minister, a counselor at school, um, a therapist. It could be any number of people, just not your best friend. Or definitely don't say, I don't know my mother or father and have them authenticate that for you. <laughs> um, but there is an option now that will get them further along in the process, but the process is not complete until the college or university agrees and they do not have to, if you don't present a compelling case for it. So refusal is not a reason not to do the FAFSA. Any other questions, Julie? I think that pretty much concludes. Um, some of the questions kind of go into the actual FAFSA form. So I'm gonna okay. hold off on answering those because a lot of those questions will be answered in FAFSA 101. Um, so I think we should be good there, but um, thank you all for joining today. We're ending right on time just so that we can um, end the recording. But again, as we mentioned, all of this information will be sent out to you.